Should we get into some of the reads here for the week? Uh, this is one that I just found today. Uh, it says, hi, Bill. Fuck you. So right there, I'm in. Um, I've got something that may interest you, you, gin- you ginger cunt. Uh, I'm a British. I'm British and a big football fan, not soccer. Fuck you. It's called football. And that's already two reasons to hate me. I'm a, I say I'm a big football fan. In fact, I'm also a fat fuck. That's three reasons. Anyway, I have an interesting baseball story that you might not know. If you do, then fuck you. In fact, I'm too locked down drunk to be able to give the details in coherent enough fashion for your fat, ginger, your fat finger reading skills to manage. Just look up Gary Thomason, the ex-Dodger and Yankee player who went to Japan. His name has become a byword for something pointless but beautifully maintained. Look it up. It's fucking interesting. I'm going to bed now. Cheers. Fat fuck so-and-so. Uh, P.S. I love your show. All right. So I looked this up. Um, where the hell is it? The Unfortunate Legacy of Gary Thomason. And he was right. He was a guy that played in the uh, MLB. He played for the Dodgers and the Yankees. And then he signed a big contract in Japan. Here is his story. Gary Thomason was an American baseball player who lost his mojo when he moved to Japan. But despite his, despite his less than stellar career, his name still lives on today. Thanks to Japanese artist, I hope I say, I'm not going to say this right, Akas, Akasegawa Genpai. It's a killer name, whatever. It's, Akasegawa Genpai. Uh, Thomason has become an eponym. I don't know how to say that word. Oh, Jesus Christ, I need to get smarter if I'm going to be fucking talking to people. Epo. Nim. I've spelt it wrong. Let's see. Pronunciation. How do you. Oh, fuck you with the fucking goddamn fucking windows. Have I ever said yes to any of that? When are you going to quit? Pronunciation. How do you say it? How do you. Oh, wait. I had the sound off. All right, here we go. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Eponym. 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 I never would have guessed that. All right. His name has become an eponym for a truly bizarre type of architecture. What the fuck just happened? It just scrolled without me. His name has become an eponym for a truly bizarre type of architecture. Objects that are completely useless but still carefully maintained. If you've ever lived in a major city, you've probably seen your fair share of architectural oddities. Perhaps you've spotted a handrail where there aren't any stairs or a door that opens to a brick wall. Maybe you've noticed vents with nothing to ventilate or a section of a fence you can easily walk around. Picture, pictured above, you can see a skyway that no longer connects to anything, uh, yet wasn't demolished and it, with its connected building for some reason. Well, that's probably because they would have charged more money, I would think, to take that fucking thing down. The other building's like, we're not, we're not paying for it. And they were like, well, fuck it, then we're just going to leave it. I'm guessing. I have no idea. All right, the whole bushel here. Here we go. If you've ever lived in a major city, I read all of that. Ba 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 ba. Anyway, uh, there are, these are some remnants of expanding cities. Why the fuck? Oh, because it keeps loading advertising. It keeps moving on me here. Um, these are remnants of expanding cities, but what's confusing is many of these ridiculous doors and pointless pipes are still carefully maintained. While they serve no purpose, they're repainted when they grow rusty or repaired when they fall apart. They also have their own name. They're called Thomasons. So who nicknamed these silly structures and why? Well, the culprit is a Japanese artist named Agasagawa Genpai. Uh, one day in 1972, he was on his lunch break in Tokyo when something caught his eye. That's on my bucket list to go there, by the way. Uh, it was a staircase that went up and down like all staircases do, only there was no door at the top. They were stairs to nowhere. But what really amazed Agasagawa, uh, Agasigawa was the railing. It was, obviously, it was obvious that at one time or another, the railing had come apart, but what blew I guess Saga was mine was someone had fixed the darn thing. Now the railing was good as new, even though there was no reason why anyone would ever use those stairs. Mystified, 
Agasawa searched the city for more worthless wonders. Whenever he found an out-of-place pole or a gate in the middle of nowhere, he'd snap a photo. He considered these doors and stairs artistic byproducts of the city. I'm going to give you this guy's name so you can look up his work. It's A-K, I'll spell it, A-K-A, A-K-A-S-E-G-A-W-A. Um, I can't imagine there's somebody else. Maybe that name is like Mike over there. So I'll give you his last fucking name here. Um, Genpai, G-E-N-P-E-I. If you want to look up his work as I continue to read here. Um, one day, 1972, let's see, blah, blah, blah. It was obvious that at one time or another, I read that. Oh, so he considered them artistic byproducts of the city. And soon he was published... Publishing the pictures in a, in a photography magazine complete with little articles on the, na- the nature of their existence. That's a great book. Um, coffee table book. Um, he also created a name for these vest- vestigial structures. I don't know how to say that word. Fuck. I'm getting killed here today. Okay, let's look this one up. Vestigial Pronunciation. Here we go. Here we go. Vestigial. Vestigial. Oh, man, you got to work that into your fucking... Well, you can't really go to a party. I I already forgot how to say it. Vestigial. Vestigial. I like that one. I'm getting sick and tired of this vestigial shit. Um, so in order, does that even make sense? So in, in order to be a Thomason, an object must be cared for even though it's completely pointless. Wait, I skipped over a bunch of shit. God damn it. He called them Thomasons after baseball player Gary Thomason, who, was played for, who played for teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees. While Thomason was a fine player in the States, things changed dramatically when he signed on with the Yomiuri Giants, a team based in Tokyo. Once Thomason arrived in the land of the rising sun, he couldn't hit a ball to save his life. I bet what happened was he got in his head and then he compiled it with the fact that he was this American representing an entire country and the pressure just got too big. Um, Where are we here? Um, He couldn't hit a ball to save his life. People called him the giant human fan because all he was doing, because that was all he was doing with the bat was stirring up air. You see that? Baseball uh, sports fans are sports fans around the world. After Thomason set the all-time Japanese strikeout record in 1981, the coaches benched the poor guy, and that's how Thomason served out the rest of his contract, sitting in the dugout and making money for doing nothing. According to Agasagua, Agasagua, who's who's a huge baseball fan, Thomason had a fully formed body yet served no purpose to the world. Fuck! Oh, my God. But just like those fences and banisters he found around Tokyo, the man was still being maintained. Wow. Uh, So in order to be a Thomason, an object must be cared for even though it's completely pointless. The concept caught on and soon people were submitting their own Thomasons to Agasegawa's for approval. Agasegawa for approval. In 1985, the artist published his findings in a book called Hyper Art Thomason, which was translated into English in 2009. Oh, my God. This is like international Bill Buckner. The book inspired a new group of Thomason hunters, particularly in, particularly in San Francisco. And Agasegawa's publishers even started a website where they could submit their artistic discoveries. Unfortunately, Gary Thomason's family isn't exactly pleased with the way the ball player is being portrayed. After all, who wants to be remembered for being useless? Of course, as a radio host, Roman Mars points out, how many other ball players from the 70s and 80s can you remember? Thanks to Agasego, a bunch. A bunch. I can name half of the fucking big red machine. I can name all the Yankees and the Red Sox. You don't believe me? Here we go. All right, uh, Dave Concepcion, George Foster, Pete Rose, Tom Seema, Johnny Bench, Sparky Lyle, Tony Pena. Was Cesar Geronimo on that name? What a fucking name. Was he on that team? Jose Cruz, J.R. Richards. Those are some Astros for you. The fucking Dodgers, Ron Say, Bill Russell, 
uh, Davey Lopes, Steve Garvey, Steve Yeager, Dusty Baker, Tommy Lasorda. Don't fucking challenge. I can never remember if it was Greg or Craig Nettles. Bucky Dent. Um, Chris Shambliss. Who the fuck was their second baseman? Bucky Dent was short, right? Thurman Munson, rest his soul. Reggie Jackson, Lou Pinella. Ron Guidry, Louisiana Lightning. Jim Rice, Fred Lynn, Carl Yastrzemski. What the fuck are you talking about? It's a dumb point. Um, thanks to Aga Sega was Gary Thompson's name will live on wherever people find doorknobs attached to brick walls or roads that lead smack dab into dead ends. Well, now I, I got to look that up. I'll look it up after the podcast. So there you go. Thank you. Look at that. You get a drunk fucking British guy. Guy just ate up 15 minutes of the podcast. God bless you. All right. Milwaukee. Hi, Bill. I'm a lady listener. Hey, welcome. Welcome. I love when the ladies write in. I'm a lady listener from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was wondering what your take is on the Democratic National Convention, which is supposed to be in Milwaukee in August. Do you think it will still happen? What do you think needs to happen at the convention to get people excited about Biden? Uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, Joe Biden making you exciting is excited. It'd be like having somebody tone deaf sing a fucking song on uh, you know, in the right key. It's just not going to happen. Hope you have a chance to visit in the summertime. So do I. It is beautiful here right now. I love Milwaukee. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm at this point. I'm rooting. Can you root for other Republicans, too? Can a Republican fucking take the spot? We can just start over again? I don't know. I don't know. This is just a weird, weird-ass fucking transitional time here. In politics. Um, all right. Doctors' salaries. By the way, somebody recently, I did a, a Reddit Ask Me Anything, and people asked me about uh, overrated and underrated cities. And I said overrated was a lot of the major cities because uh, a lot of it had to do because I had been to them so many times. But uh, just the traffic, congestion, and all of that shit, how much they cost. You know, the money you got to spend and all of that shit, no place to park. And um, I was naming my like top three underrated um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Knoxville, also honorable mention, uh, big fan of Tennessee, and uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma are some of the ones that I went to that are fucking amazing. Overrated. are, And these are all great cities. They just, too many people move to them. Austin, Texas, too many fucking people. Um, I mean, it's just an absolute fucking shit show trying to get from the airport to get trying to get to the airport into Austin to your hotel is it's like if you've ever landed in Washington Dulles Airport and then, you know, especially if you're coming from the West Coast, you land right at rush hour. I mean, it's like fucking two hours just to get to your fucking hotel. Um, that's why I, I always try to fly into Reagan. Fly right in there, jump in a cab, boom, you're there. It costs more, but I don't give a fuck. Um, I'm kind of into the uh, the same way I'm into smaller cities. I'm into smaller airports. I like doing that, and I don't give a fuck if I have to pay more money. I just like that way better than dealing with uh, the bigger. The bigger ones I liked going to when I was a younger man, but now that I'm an older man and I don't want to fucking deal with lugging my luggage and all of that shit. And they have wheels. My luggage has wheels like everybody else. All right. And I'm still talking about lugging it. That's how fucking old I am. All right. Dr. Salaries, everybody. Dear Bodacious Billington. Billington. Can I come watch it? Uh, my daughter has a virtual virtual uh, dance recital. Hang on a second. I gotta, I'll be right back. Uh, what's up? Uh, you need to watch me. What are you going to go do? All right, hang on. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. All right. I'll hang on a second, guys. All right. I just crushed the parent daughter dance. Killed it. You know, some moves that have never been seen before. Oh, Jesus. Um, all right. I'm back. All right. Doctor's salaries. Dear Bodacious 
Billing team. Uh, that intro was what Gmail suggested to me when I typed Bill. That's artificial intelligence for you. Uh, love the podcast. Okay. Some orthopedic surgeons and plastic surgeons make over $750,000 a year, while many general medicine doctors and pediatricians make under $225,000 a year. The highest paid surgeons are clearly overpaid. Um, and what, as compared to the other ones? Dude, somebody's operating on your face. I mean, how do you, how do you put a price on that? You, I don't think I would want a bargain bin shopping for that. I don't know. Uh, but do you think general medicine doctors like your primary care doctor or your daughter's pediatrician and their are, peers are underpaid? Well, this next point is what I was going to bring up. They often leave medical school with 200000 to $300,000 in debt. Physicians often work 60 plus hours a week with 10 to 20 of those hours being spent doing paperwork and dealing with bullshit pharmaceutical and insurance companies. We need more doctors. And with those salaries versus debts, we won't get them. Do you think we should pay doctors, not surgeons, more? Or do you think that even with that debt, they should be happy with what they have? Um, Oh, I imagine like with any business, the people that employ them are keeping the lion's share of the money and they probably um, exploit people. Like, it's kind of, I mean, capitalism gets a bad rap. I mean, I just kind of see people getting exploited in every country that I fucking go to. So uh, it, I think it's a human thing, not really a form of government thing. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think out of everybody out there, as far as like earning a living, earning the money that you're, you're being paid. The fact that these people help you prevent you from dying. I don't know how you put a price on that. That's really the most important thing out there is staying alive. And, um, as far as like, uh, orthopedic surgeons, I mean, yeah, your quality of life is so much more improved. Those are the people that give you like, you know, hip replacements, knee replacements. You can actually walk around, right? Fuck. I got to look that up. Orthop- I get all of those confused, except for gynecology, just because there's been so many jokes about it. I know podiatrist, too. That's just because I'm old. Orthopedic surgeon. Spelt it wrong. Uh, orthopedic surgeon. Oh, for fuck's sakes. No, they're just giving me a bunch of fucking orthopedic surgeons' names. All right, Wikipedia. Is the branch of surgery concerned with involving the musculoskeletal system? By the way, let me see. Who's the first guy that comes up? Oh, it's people in your neighborhood. I was like, who's like the fucking Kevin Hart, you know, like the biggest or Sebastian, like the biggest, the Dave Chappelle of uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons that if you Google them, like their name just comes up. That's fucking interesting. Uh, we need more doctors and they'll say, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem giving them more money. I mean, I don't pay them. I, I imagine there's somebody that the guy who owns the hospital, the team owner. Um, that's actually kind of fascinating. Uh, but then as far as like plastic surgeons, um, you know, everybody thinks it's somebody getting tits or fucking fake asses or something like that. But, you know, there's also people that, you know, get into car accidents and stuff like that. And these people, you know, get you know, lacerations to the face. You did such a great job, buddy. Yes, I did. You did. <laughs> did you have fun in the dance class? Yeah. How did, did daddy dance okay? Yes. I'm making a very, what you do when you interview a kid, you don't ask yes or no questions. You got to uh, ask. How did you feel about dance class? What is it that you like about dance class? I like about mommy go poopy. You like it that mommy goes poopy? She's, she's potty trained now, so she's all about poop. But, yeah. Okay, that's your statement on dance class, is that mommy goes poopy? Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to add? Because i got to get back to the podcast. Yes. Um, I like to play Candyland Shoots and Ladders. You like to play Candyland and Shoots and Ladders. What about those walkie-talkies? Yes, walkie-talkies. <laughs> All right, are we going to play when I'm done here? Um, no. No. <laughs> Come on, buddy. We're going to go play wiffle ball. Okay? T-ball.
T-ball, yeah, T-ball, sorry. 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 Well, I, I'm old, so I use the different references. Um, and then we play catch. No! All right, come on. Let me, let me knock this out, and then we'll go play, all right? Hey, great job, buddy. Got it. You got it. All right. Um, close the door, buddy. Hey. Thank you. Um, all right. Where was I? Okay, advice, email. Popping boners at work. Well, here's a guy who doesn't eat for hymns. I'm a 21-year-old male from, I'm not going to say where, who moved to Washington for a decent education. Um, all right. The state he's from is also the last name of one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and that state isn't known for its education. And my family wanted me to have a chance in today's world. Anyway, I recently got a job at a grocery store so I could make some cash on the side and take advantage of an increased need of healthy people willing to work during a pandemic. Here's the problem. 99% of the women in this state dress like they just ran the Boston Marathon. They wear yoga pants that show off their hips or loose shirts that show a lot of cleavage. Maybe I'm just an ignorant male, but in the state of blah, 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 most people, most people, People, women included, wear pants or cargo shorts that aren't flaunting their bodies 24-7. I'm having a difficult time not having hard-ons during my shift hours. I'm not claiming to have a magnum dong, but when I look down, you can clearly see I'm aroused since I tuck my shirt in and wear a belt like a gentleman. If knee is there, I'm sure it'll end up being my fault. Oh, shit. Shots fired. But I swear I'm not drooling over these women. It's just hard, pun included, intended, I think you meant, to not notice their mostly beautiful bodies, especially when they flaunt it so casually. It's kind of like if a lady has really colorful hair or or if an attractive 30-plus-year-old lady wears white yoga pants with a black thong. It's something your, your eyes, brain, and dung would want to look at. Any advice would be appreciated. Go fuck yourself. Uh, my advice is hang in there, buddy. Hang in there. All right? You got two positive going for yourself. One, your dick works. There's people out there they got to take for hymns. You're all right. Okay? So you're fine. And then secondly, you know, I imagine if you got a job at a titty bar the first couple of days, you'd be like, God damn, look at all these fucking titties. And then after a while, it's just titties. I think you'll get used to it, and I think you'll be fine. As long as you don't start rubbing your dick, you know, with your hand or up against whatever fucking, I don't know, their food or some shit, you should be fine. Um, You know, but yeah, what are you supposed to do? If they're coming in there with wearing their fucking, I mean, listen, I've been out here in L.A., forever and i still almost hit a tree every time i drive down the street some of the the lack of clothing that the women wear out here god bless them i'm not complaining all right hey hypoth- she's not wearing it for you she's wearing it for her fucking comfort oh really listen i've watched enough fucking baseball to know when the catcher's frame in the fucking strike zone to make a ball look like a strike so get the fuck out of here with that bullshit um hypothetical dilemma Bill, I got one for you. Uh, you're you, but you're not famous for comedy. Okay, oh, it's a dilemma. Okay, you're you, but you're not famous for comedy. You're just a hardware store employee in Boston. A member of British royalty falls in love with you. It doesn't even matter if you love her back. Maybe you do. The question is, could you keep your mouth shut and eat your cake and have it too? Oh, would I marry her? No. I couldn't do it. Could you marry into that and be responsible for acting as the palace required? No, I would feel like a fucking loser. Uh, Remember, you might get all sorts of cool luxuries, but have to attend lots of events, though. Keep in mind that life in a one bedroom in Medford might not be that bad. No, I I couldn't do that. If I loved her, I would do it. But even then, I would just be, I would be constantly saying, hey, I, you don't need to buy me anything. Can I at least pay for the cable in the palace? Can I do something? Can I wash the royal dishes? I have to do something to earn my keep. 
I'm not going to sit here because if I really honestly don't have to do anything other than go to these, I'll tell you what I would do is I would become a fucking drunk. I would become a fucking drunk. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just got a fucking message from my fucking agent. Um, postponed Oh no. Oh Jesus Christ. I was hoping that's about moving a fucking date. God damn it. You know, you start to get excited. Um all right, let's 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 wrap up the podcast here. All right, great songs, not the hits. This we're going deep cuts. I don't know why we haven't done this before. I love this shit. All right, this guy says, or this lady says, um, wait, did I answer this thing? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I would have to keep working in the fucking hardware store, but then you have a level of fame and then you have security around you. It would, it would, I wouldn't want to be famous for being with somebody who's famous. That's not how I'm fucking wired. And I got to tell you, from what I heard, Medford's really fucking nice now. Okay, electricity. All right. Do not do your own electrical work, you moron. Period. Okay, thanks for the tip. Here's another tip for electric outlets. Hey, Bill, uh, this is a pretty bare-bones email, so I'll just get right to the point. When you replace an outlet, you have to be careful which direction you twist the wire. The goal is to twist the wire in the direction that the screws twists when tightening if you're looking at the back of the outlet you want to twist the right side down and twist the right side up that doesn't make sense the right side down and the right side up this way when you're starting you start tightening the screw the twist in the wire doesn't start coming undone it's a small tip but can help you out tremendously thanks for the mmp and congratulations on kid number two thank you um I, 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 I'm thankful for both of those. To be honest with you, I don't think I'm going to do the outlets only because if I were to ever cause a fire, God for fucking bid, um, even if we did get out of the house from the relentless smoke detectors, it probably then wouldn't work. Um, I'd burn down my fucking house and they, they would find, they would somehow, I don't know how firemen do this. You know, they always find the cause of the fucking fire. It's like, isn't like what caused the fire on fire? Wasn't that the beginning of the fire? So it would have been on the on fire the most. Like, how come my bedroom doesn't exist anymore, but you can find this fucking outlet and the fact that it wasn't wired properly? You know? They always fucking find what it is. And I get that different things burn differently, right? Like, obviously, a piece of paper is going to be totally gone. Where something that's metal or something like that might just be all charred up and shit like that. But, uh, you know, you can't start a fire with something that isn't flammable. If you just take one match and then you put it on a piece of paper and then stick it underneath some shit that's already there that's flammable. How do they know it's... And then you take the match and walk away. How do they find it? They, they, They figure it out. What are you rooting against them, Bill? I don't know what I'm saying. All right, tip for electric outlets. I just did that. Um, I would love to do it because I have like five or six outlets that are just, you know, one works good and the other one doesn't, and I'm just fucking sick of it. So you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to buy all the outlets and then I'm just going to have an electrician do it. All right, so everybody can fucking relax. And then once again, I'll pay for something that I probably could have done by myself. All right, bankers. Uh, Dear Billy Banker Cunt. I'm a 21-year-old college student majoring in finance, or as you would say, future banker cunt. Yes, I don't think you're a cunt yet, but you, what's going to happen is you're going to get involved in that game, and you either play ball or you get whacked. Uh, when you ran about greedy bankers, who at the banks are you referring to? Tellers, security, IT, board members? And is it all banks? Are there any in particular you aren't a fan of? I think banks are great. They loan money to students for college, small businesses, and make homes and car purchases possible. Without banks, this stuff wouldn't be possible for people with pockets not as deep as yours. (laughs) Money you have rightfully earned. 
Average American can't write a check for that stuff. I know you complain about interest rates being too high. Interest is determined on how likely the person taking the loan will be able to pay back the loan. Pay the loan back. More risk to the bank means higher interest. Just like with any investment you and I make, we want more reward for more risk we take. Doesn't this kid just sound like a college student? You're basically explaining banking to me that if it's done properly, this is how it works. Uh, At any point during this email, are you going to allude to what the fuck they did for over 40 to 50 years to gradually get themselves completely deregulated so we had what happened in 2008? And the the fucking bubble that they're now creating again with these fucking uh, high-rise luxury apartments? That's all of our money. What about that? What about the fact that back in the day when they were regulated, I forget what it was, but if you if you deposited a thousand dollars in, they were only able to loan out like 30 percent on a thousand or something like that. It was a responsible number. And then they just kept going after these politicians and paying them off. And then eventually not only could they loan out the entire thousand, they could loan off another thousand dollars to two other people. So off your grand, they could loan out three grand. So they basically counterfeited two grand. That's not even there. And then you combine it with the fact that they then had these new rules that made people who weren't qualified to get homes to get homes, which then drove up the prices of the fucking houses. You had what happened in 2008. That's why I think they're cunts. And then after they fucked everybody over and old people who thought they had their, their savings, the money that they earned, then had to spend the rest of their life fucking, you know, eating dog food. And these fucking cunts at AIG then say that, you know, hey, we're too big to fail. Bail us out. And then we had to bail them out with money that we now pay interest on. That's why they're cunts. OK, you just sitting here explaining to me how in a perfect world you know, banking operates. I understand that. All right. Lastly, he says, if you keep your entire life savings in a cash, in cash, in a bank, you are an idiot. Up to $250,000 is federally insured per bank account. That money should be with a wealth management company so the money can grow and be safe. Thanks for listening. Go fuck yourself. Well, listen, buddy, I will, I will chalk this up to the fact that you're a young person. And what you'll quickly realize is that how the game works is they have is you're going to put your money in play or they're going to take it. And then when you put it in play, you're going to be exposed. And they're going to take it that way. That's basically how it is. And, and you can try to be conservative as you I mean. If I keep my entire life savings in, in, in cash in the bank, I'm not an idiot for doing that. I'm an idiot because I believe that the banks are it's actually going to be there. But 250 grand, if I live my life correctly and off of interest and whatever else and whatever I was still earning, if I just live within my means, then I am not an idiot. I'm actually a responsible citizen. But this whole idea that, you know, you can, you can never have enough money, you have to keep putting it out there, is because our economy is a fucking Ponzi scheme. That's why. And if people start pulling out and they stop playing the fucking game, the whole thing collapses. So I would look up on that. All right. Woodrow Wilson's letter of regret, the Federal Reserve, all of that type of shit, how the Federal Reserve is actually a private bank, uh, a private corporation. I mean, I went down that rabbit hole. I'm, I'm done with it because nobody gives a fuck. And this, we're all tied into the lie. But like, you know, um, I don't know. This is something that you want to do, so I don't want to shit all over it. But, you know, if you read up on it, you know, I've actually sat in banks talking to people, talking about how fucked up it is. And they get this look on their face. They're like, yeah, I know. I know. And I'm like, so what are you going to do? You doing gold coins? They're like, yeah, I do a little bit of that. They're even hedging their bets. But I just look at it like, you know, by the time this person figured out what they were getting involved in, they already had a major in that and fucking college loans and they were already running on the wheel. But I might be wrong. I could be wrong about all this. I hope I am. I hope banks are the way that you said they are. Has not been my experience from the little that I know. Uh, My girlfriend is racist against me. Hi, Bill. I've been dating uh, this girl for a year. She is Asian American. I am half Caucasian and half Hispanic, but I look white. Uh, She was telling me it's funny that I'm half Hispanic because her Hispanic friend objected to her dating me 
when I thought I was just white. Uh, Normally, I wouldn't let this bother me because part of me gets it. All people of color have experienced some sort of racism from white people. Um, The conversation made me uncomfortable, and she must have picked up on it because she started defending her friend. All right. You said, normally I wouldn't let this bother me because I get it. All right, but it did did bother you because I guess you like this girl and she's saying this shit. She began bashing white people and explaining to me that I'm one of the good ones. Um, I come from a liberal mixed family. I said that even though I get it, I still don't think that they should assume I'm conservative racist just because I'm white. She began to lecture me about white privilege and how racism against whites isn't the same as racism against people of color, which I agree with, but does that make it okay? I will never truly understand. They're basically arguing because they're not in a position of power where their racism can affect you getting a job or not getting a job. It can't affect you if you're walking in a park at night and they decide to jump you. But other than that, white racism as the theory goes and is presented holds way more power because they can actually end your fucking dreams. Um, Which I love when white people then try to explain to people who aren't white that that's not the case. Let me explain your experience. Um, Although people who aren't white explain white people to white people. It's just what people do. Everybody knows everything. I think you haven't, you learned that in the pandemic. Somebody said it to me the other day. It was like the amount of people without medical degrees telling me how to avoid getting the coronavirus. We're all full of shit, okay? And I am too. I yelled at a smoke. I called a smoke detector a cunt, people. All right. I will never truly understand their experiences. I know that. But at what point are they being hypocritical? Um, the fair question. I, I understand that. I understand that. I've been in this situation. Uh, It made me think of when Dorothy lands in Oz and they want to know if she's a bad witch or a good witch. And she's like, I'm not a witch. witch, I'm just a kid from Kansas. Uh, This isn't the first time I've had to establish that. I'm one of the good ones. I assume you and Nia have been through the same thing. Oh, we fucking argue all the time about shit like this. It's actually, uh, it could be a show. Like we have, and then in the end, I, I usually end up like, being able to explain myself in a way that she understands and she's able to explain her way in a way that she understands. Um, this is basically the deal. As long as me and my wife don't watch the news, we get along great. <laughs> um, do I just keep trying to prove that I'm one of the good ones? No. Do I call her out on her hypocrisy? Both. Do I let it go? I don't know any. Well, what I usually say when people do that, it's like, you know, I just go, you know, you sound like a white person. Um, and then I also tell them when they try to hit me with that, this white people are just inherently evil. It's like, no, what you're seeing is any race of people with unchecked power. That's what happens is eventually, you know, I don't know what it is. Uh, it is a fascinating thing where I feel like people that crave power and then their psychological makeup is an interesting thing because um, I don't know. Most people I know that are cool are not into wanting to control shit and people who aren't controlling people are not cool to be around. Um, but then having said that somebody has to lead the herd. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I get this weird point in my life where I, I just really, I don't know, fucking know anything anymore. Um, He says, I don't know anymore. I don't want to be one of those white people trying to act like they're equally victimized. No, you never want to do that. That's a bad look because of their skin color. Like, yeah, it's a double standard. Yeah, mine is getting choked to death by a cop. Uh, Other than that, yeah, exactly. Minus the slavery and all of that bullshit and all the fucking shit that's actually in your head that you don't even fucking address to other people. Other than that, yeah, it's the exact same fucking experience. Um, Yeah, but having said that, there's only so much of that horse shit that you can fucking listen to. You know what I mean? That's like when I listen, like when white female comics start fucking complaining, you know, about how difficult you can listen to it. You're like, okay, I get it. I get it to a fucking point. Um, And then it just gets to the point of being like, you know, not for nothing. You're kind of further in your career than I was when I was at your, you know, 
when I was doing it for five years. So, I mean, I think the fact that you are a woman makes you stand out. It's actually kind of helping you more than it's hurting you. Am I crazy here? Um, but I know that that's not how white, it works with white women. White women are the victim's victim. <laughs> Don't get me fucking started with that shit. I had a great bit back in the day when I did stand up about how white women, how they fucking, just incredibly, how they sidestepped their own white privilege and just dumped it all on white guys. Fucking unbelievable. Stroke of genius. Um, and then stuck themselves at the front of the line. As far as, you know, people speaking out about being oppressed. It's, it was amazing. All right. And with that, I'll stop doing parts of my act that I can't even remember anymore. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, hey, Bill. Okay. Celebrity message video. Um, hey, Billy Wood. You're a smart guy. Oh, gee. Here comes the insult. Hey, Bill. He already has his arm around me. Hey, Mikey. What'd you get lost? Uh, hey, Billy Wood, you're a smart guy. No, I'm not. And you've come up with a lot of cool ideas. If you were to produce a celebrity video where they talk or sing to the camera, what would you... I cannot believe the amount of celebrities that still do those videos. No, every, no matter what the fucking message is, you're going to get shit all over. You know? And sometimes fans are right, and other times they just hate you because they see how big your kitchen is. You can't win. <laughs> oh, regular people really fucking annoyed me, really annoy me with their hypocrisy when they make fun of fucking celebrities. And rather than seeing themselves, you know, and all the fucking bullshit in their life, they think that their lives aren't as bad as celebrities' lives because they have a, a humble sized kitchen. You're all the same fucking people. You just don't know how to act. You know, maybe if you regular people learned how to pretend a little better, you could get a big, bigger kitchen. I mean, how great is this fucking country? If you can pretend to be somebody you're not, you can get a giant kitchen. Um, if you were to produce a celebrity video where they talk or sing to the camera, what would you do? I wouldn't do it because I know they would all be yelling at me, telling me that I fucked them over because you guys would all trash them. What song would you all sing? <laughs> This is such a funny question. Any celebrities of note that you would have, assuming you could have anyone? And Bill, more, most importantly, what's the message you want to get out there? Hugs and kisses. I would do a parody of it because I lack the talent to execute it, you know, to actually do a good one. So I would do a parody of it. And I would probably, I would do it about gold digging whores or I would do it about white women never feeling that they were wrong or I would do it about all the white women talking about white women that they know who are actually named Karen, who are actually good people. Um, watching white women trying desperately not to be called on their fucking bullshit, you know, and not and, and for them not to be fucking labeled is one of my favorite things I've watched in a while. So I would probably do a video on that. And um, I'm trying to think if there's a song named Karen. Because they get there's, there's oh, Sherry and lady. They're always singing. Well, I'm the type of guy, you know, there's Ethel on my left. How funny is that Wanderer song? There's Gladys on me and this flow on me. It's all old lady names now, but back then it's just like. Flo is fucking young and hot. Oh, God, I'd love to get in her giant underpants um, with all the fucking frills on the back. Um, he's a boogie 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 boy of hairy bushes. Um, let me see. Is there a song named Karen? Karen lyrics. Karen, I'm not talking. I, let's see, videos. I, I would use this, the first song I find. Karen's song. Uh, the new gen, the new the Karen New Generation. No, I, I don't want it to be Karen Hip Hop. Let me just write Karen Love Song so I get an old school one. Love Song. All right. Karen Love Song. Let's see here. If this, this, this is probably the one I would use. After I get past the advertising. After I get past the advertising. 
Okay, skip the ad. You know, people, there are so many white women out there named Karen. And they're not bad people. They're soccer moms. They're nurses. I don't think this is English. They're white women, just like you and me. Dealing with the toxic white males in their lives. Then I cut to a white woman named Karen, and she'd already be crying. I mean, I know that that black people, I mean, African Americans have it really difficult in this country. And I know that white police officers have taken a lot of liberties, but just imagine what it's like to be actually living with that white police officer. (laughs) Something like that. I think that's how it would go. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck that song was. I wonder if when they go into a fucking, like if I was a record producer and they were, when, when I was producing a song that fucking cheesy about some chick named Karen, right? Or a fucking lady or whatever. She, I would try to talk to the other bandmates and be like, hey guys, is is this like a real chick? Does he really feel this stuff? Or can we kind of fucking break balls as we record this, knowing that we're all just trying to make a pile of cash and act like we're sensitive people rather than we fuck everything that moves and do a mountain of cocaine during the recording and touring of this album? Is this an actual Karen? And then the people in the band be like, uh, we don't know, man. He hasn't talked to us in a while. Uh, he, he's on a separate tour bus. Or... They fucking hate the lead singer so much that they say, no, you know, it isn't a real woman. And then I would say something stupid about her. And then that'd be this big fucking thing. And then I would get replaced and in would walk Ted Templeman. Uh, All right. New father, bad relationship. Dear Bill, what the fuck do I do? Um, Oh, wait, are you asking me advice? Oh, shit. It's time for me to play my jingle. Where is it? One of these days I'm going to get organized. Come on. Come on. Come on. It's time. Hey! That's me. There you go. There you go. All right. You have a question. I, if you have a question, people, I will give you an answer. Okay? I will give you. I mean, I don't have the answer, but I'll give you one. If you want advice, I'll say something. I will move my jaw and make sounds in your directions. All right? Directions? Direction. All right. What the fuck do, what the fuck do I do, man? Uh, he's like that dude in platoon. I got a bad feeling. My girlfriend keeps pressuring me into marrying her. We have a seven month old babe. Jesus fucking Christ, dude, you are married for the next 20 fucking years. Um, we have a seven month old baby girl together. And I feel like if we didn't have her, we probably wouldn't be together now. My daughter is my world. Wow. 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 From time to time, I get hit with this wave of, fuck, I want to leave her. I do love her, but I feel like we're too much different from one another. Her fucking family is so involved. They're great, but it's fucking annoying. All right. If you do love her and you do have a kid, at some point, you got to put your kid, you know, I, I don't know, dude. I've never been in this situation, thank God. But, uh, you know, I would sit down. You got to talk this out. I mean, I, I would talk to a therapist because the fact that you still want to leave, you got to figure out why. You, do you want to leave because you love her just because you stayed with her long enough that you love her like a friend or do you love her, love her? But you already have a Mr. Lover, lover. You have a fucking kid. So I, w- I would talk to a professional about this. But as far as the family, you just got to you know, set up some boundaries, um, which involves you really thinking about what you want to say and then sit down and have a talk if somebody's, you know, crossing the line there, weaving over the double line, as they say there. Uh, the other day, my girl was bitching about her having to be at home with the baby all the time while I work six days a week and long hours. Well, get used to that, pal. Uh, it's always about them. She says that she feels like a slave. <laughs> 
I know. Like you're out there fucking yeah. It's like I'm out there fucking working, feeding all of you. Okay? We had a kid. We bought you think I want to work six days a week? I don't want to work six days a week the way you don't want to fucking stay home the whole fucking time. You know, but trying to get them to understand that that's 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 a that's a 90 degree fucking grade hill, which is a cliff, buddy. And it's got ice on the face. Um, I'm like, what the fuck? Um, how all you have to do is clean occasionally and cook occasionally. It's not like I'm forcing her to clean and cook and take care of shit. Sometimes she doesn't feel like it, and I don't care because I understand she's feeling tired from taking care of our baby. All right, so you got some empathy there. Um, I I will tell you, having a baby, I mean, that's all-encompassing. It's not like when they go to sleep, you have all this energy. You know, you sleep when they sleep. When I move, you move. Just like that, right? Ludicrous. When they sleep, you sleep, right? Um... She also, dude, like a lot of things that women say during this time, you just, they're just overly tired. They're overly emotional. You know what I mean? Their hormones, whatever, whatever fucking excuses they have. And what you have to do is you, your job is to push down that everything that you're feeling. Okay. And slowly inch your way towards your first heart attack at 58. Um, oh, I got some shit to say on this one, but let's, let's just plow through here. Then she says, we're not even married. And I'm like, what the fuck does that have to do with anything? Um, it has to do with like her fucking the end of the price is right. You know, is she going to win the showcase? Is she going to get both showcases? She needs to know what's going to happen. Anyways, I'm fucking I fucking work and you take care of home. Seems fair to me. And I pay all the bills. She occasionally helps and is willing if I ask, but I prefer to take care of it. Yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm earning money to keep the lights on and food on the table and a roof over our head, and you're taking care of the kid. We're parents. This is it. This is this, this fucking bill of goods that corporations sold women that you can actually have it all um, was, was, is a lie, and they just wanted you to keep spending and feeling like you needed more. I mean, you guys are together and you have a beautiful daughter and you that's your world. You don't need anything else. But what about that Cuisinart? Uh like she gets to have fun all she um like she gets to have fun still. She gets to hang out with her family, go swimming or whatever. You guys have a pool? That's fucking amazing. I can never do shit because I have only one day off and on my off day I fucking run errands. Oh, Jesus. I know. I know. And nobody cares. And do whatever dumb shit she wants to do. This this is it, dude. This is this is. Yeah, this is welcome. This is being a dad. This kind of bitching occurs time to time. And I'm and I'm tired of it. She's always bitching, saying I don't share emotion or spend time with her. Well, you're going to have to work on that. There's ways of just acting like you're doing it and they'll believe it. Just make an effort. I'm the worst, dude. Don't listen to me. Uh, If I'm not at work, I'm with her. I even do the laundry alone at at the laundromat. I wash, dry, and fold while she stays home on my day off. Okay, but you have a pool, but you don't have a laundry. So I think you have a pool at your apartment or there's a town pool she goes to. But still, a pool is the shit. I wash, dry, and if it's not yours, you don't have to take care of it. That's even better. I wash, dry, and fold while she stays home on my day off. She just wants to bitch. She keeps pressuring me to marry her, and it keeps, and it makes me just want to run. But now that we have a baby, I'm scared that if we don't last, um, how it'll affect our daughter. Yeah, you should be thinking of your daughter first. I'm not even attracted to her the way I used to be. I don't know what to do. Well, yeah, I mean, if somebody's bitching at you all the time and you're that fucking tired. You just, they, they, you fail to see who they were. This is something that could help you guys. If there's someone in a really involved family could watch the baby for a day or two, you take a day off from work and you guys just get away and maybe, you know, remember again why you guys liked each other in the first place. Cause that's been great for me 
in my life. But I will tell you this. This is something that as a man, you have to just suck up and understand is that the male-female relationship is all about the woman. All right? That's what it is. And as much as they say they want to hear from you and they want to know what you're thinking, it's, it's about them. Always. Them and their emotions comes first. It, even, it, it comes before the kids. You know, that's how it, that's, you know, if they're not happy, no one gets to be happy. There's no, hey, the kids are here. It's, it's just how it fuck. It's how they're wired. All right. They can also make a baby. So there's there's that. So you got to focus on the positive. But and here's the thing. As the guy, you're going to be doing all of this shit. Working your ass off. You're going to die before she does. And none of it is going to be acknowledged. OK. And if you want a little credit, you're being fucking selfish. OK. And that's basic. I'm speaking in generalities, but that is essentially what goes on there. All right. So. You're just going to have to suck it up and occasionally go out and get some beers with other guys that you know who are dads who are in the same situations. And you'll exchange stories. And at first, you're going to be a little pissed. And then you're just going to start laughing. It's why guys are so funny. It's because of the situations that we end up in. Um, And like having a kid is really difficult and you know, both people's lives have to adjust because you have the kid. But um, one person, it is acknowledged, you know, it's constantly acknowledged um, what a woman goes through during pregnancy, the importance of the role of a mother and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And and for guys, it's basically like, hey, fucking stick around. They need you. All right. Don't be afraid to do the laundry and cook and clean and fucking all of this other shit. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, buddy. Uh, I would do what you need. I, I would, I think you need to work on your relationship and I'm not putting this on you, but I think you need to try to communicate to her how you're feeling. And, um, this is a very tricky thing because you could marry her and she could become even more of a fucking nightmare or you could marry her and that could have been the issue and then she can fucking settle down because maybe she's getting pressure from her family that you know that they had a you know a kid she had a kid out of wedlock I don't know how religious her it might be that you know but I, I can tell you this trying to make somebody else happy is not something that you can do it's impossible. So what you have to do is, you know, look out for yourself. So I would, I would talk to a therapist about what the fuck is going on. And I would not marry her until you feel like that's what you want to do. Okay. And, you know, when you sit down with her, you can tell her about the pressure that you're underneath. And uh, I would stop short of saying, you know, you bitching at me all the fucking time. Why the hell would I marry you? That's what you say to your guy friend at the bar. Um, but as someone who was fucking had to be dragged, kicking and screaming, I got married so late in life. I wish I did it a lot younger. And I love being married, despite all this shit that I'm saying. There are certain things like there's, you know, my wife would come on here and do fucking nine hours with no guest about what a fucking asshole I am to live with. So I'm not trying to make my wife out to be a bad guy. I will just say that in general, nobody gives a shit about the guy in the relationship. Um, it's, it's just what it is. <laughs> it's just how it is. It's just how it is. Okay. And you got to accept that for your daughter. Okay. Um, and I, the fact that you had a, you have to man up. You did have a kid with this person, and you need to do everything that you can do, you know, to make sure that kid has the best childhood. So I would try the best I, I, you possibly can to uh, make this thing work, which is, means you have to try and communicate with, you know, this woman about how you're feeling. And hopefully she's a cool chick and will actually listen. All right? Rather than making everything about herself and start fucking crying and then you're consoling her because she's been a douche to you. 
Oh boy. All right. Let's, let's, let's get off this subject. All right. Um, but I have tremendous amount of issues with women. So, you know, take it all with a grain of salt, but I, I would talk to a professional rather than some fucking idiot. All right. Uh, wild animal ride. Uh, dear Billy Bison belt. Uh, loved you in the King of Staten Island. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for, uh, streaming the movie. If you could ride one wild animal, which would it be? If I could ride one? People have rode ostriches. Fuck that. Fuck that. Uh, before, see Swiss Family Robinson from movie from the 1960s. Uh, for me, I'd love to ride a kangaroo or a panther. Uh, I would not want to ride a wild animal. I would... I would want to ride a domesticated, broken animal like a pony or a horse <laughs> that is, is sad and has accepted the fact that a human being is going to get on its back, you know, just out of my own personal safety so it won't fucking throw me head over heels and then turn around and fucking maul me. You want to ride a panther? I guess you wouldn't get hurt in this scenario. You know what I'd like to do if it wouldn't kill me? I'd like to watch a ball game with a bear and have it sitting there like a raccoon does when it's eating Doritos on the couch. Some of those videos you've seen. Just sit there with the fucking bear. You know, when there's a bullshit call, just fucking both look at each other. And we both shake our heads and we go back. You know, he's got a big fucking salmon he's eating. I'd be smoking a stick. (laughs) Uh, you know what's funny? What I just pitched, I could have sold that as a movie when Clint Eastwood was doing those orangutan movies. 